Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming out on this uh, rainy uh, Wednesday uh, for the next installment of Experiments and Exploration in Bay Area Media Art. Um, before we uh, talk about today's uh, guest, uh, next Wednesday, uh, March 21st, uh, the uh, artist Lynn Hirschman Leeson will be here. And uh, uh, Lynn Hirschman is really one of the uh, most important uh, feminist artists working across different technologies to uh, over the last 30 years or so to make work. And um, she had a major retrospective at the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts uh, last year and is exhibiting her work um, internationally and uh, uh, so much of her work has influenced a lot of the discourses around uh, feminism uh, and uh, aesthetics and technology and she's going to be here to, to talk about that in her history. Uh, but today we have with us the San Francisco based musician composer and composer of experimental electronic music and sound art, uh, who's also a member of Negative Land, uh, who we saw um, in Craig Baldwin's Sonic Outlaws on Monday. Uh, John's been engaged with the medium of electronic music and sound since the mid-1980s, performing in collaboration with others and also appearing uh, solo under the pseudonym Wobbly, uh, perhaps in the name of the International Workers of the World, or maybe the wow and flutter of analog uh, audio tape. Maybe he'll let us know what, where this moniker came from. Uh, uh, his early works utilize sonic collage and musical appropriation, uh, growing out of a series of appearances with Negative Land, uh, and their live mix radio program, Over the Edge, on KPFA, which involved improvising with recorded sounds to produce music that inherently resists the act of being recorded. Wobbly's live and studio collaborations include work with Negative Land, Dieter Mobius, Fred Frith, Sina Parkins, Carl Stone, Jos John Oswald, and many others. Uh, and in 2015, he inherited the Over the Edge program uh, which continues to be broadcast on P KPFA twice a month. His recent work includes investigations of the history of, and musical aesthetics, of, uh, of uh, working with, physics, with the physics of acoustic and electrical feedback and the use of mobile devices and their built-in microphones as cybernetic improvising partners in which your phone is the instrument and your phone is always listening. Hope you'll talk to us about that. Um, his ongoing uh, project, uh, Detritus, uh, along with Steve Heiss, is dedicated to recycled, found, and discarded art and other cultural objects and materials that are rejuvenated, revivified, and transformed into new works of art. And uh, on the Detritus website, which is detritus.org, there's a great manifesto that uh, is there that I just thought would be a great way to kick off the, uh, John's talk, uh, which reads, in nature, detritus is dead plant and animal matter that makes new life possible. The very bottom of the food chain, detritus is the rotting leaves in the forest, the silt on the bottom of the pond, the thick dark mud in the salt marsh. It sticks to your shoes, it smells, but someday it will be food for something else, and that something will be food in turn, on and on up the food chain until you pick it up in the supermarket and put it in your mouth. Our society spends a lot of time telling us that there's some brand new fresh cultural produce generated from thin air and sunshine, slick and clean. They package it with pretty plastic ribbons and then feed it to us. A lot of it gets thrown away, the ribbons, the wrapping, culture becomes garbage or it dies and rots behind the refrigerator. 
but the new fluffy, shiny stuff still gets churned out and it gets forced between our teeth and we are told to swallow it. But we will not swallow. We will chew and then spit. We will play with our food and create something new and interesting from it. So join me in welcoming uh, John Lydecker. Uh, this is, I often just lecture about, I don't talk about my own work at all. I lecture about the history of uh, sampling music and audio collage, um, which in many ways is the history of recordings. Uh, as the technology shows up to record and capture music, um, people very, very quickly realized that this was not only an opportunity to capture living and recorded music as a document, as a, a photograph, as a, a form of evidence of something that actually happened, but actually as a medium that helped you take what actually happened and reshape it and um, make it into something new. It was an artistic opportunity to um, edit and compose. So um, the tools that let you manipulate and edit recordings uh, through the 20th century continue to get more and more sophisticated and the collage music that came out uh, over the decades, um, sampling music is almost a history of the tools that are available. If you listen to the sampling music in chronological order, you can hear the instruments and the tools as they came online. Um, and uh, the reason why is because if someone's using a piece of music in their music, if they're using a sample that everyone's already aware of, then you can hear what the musicians were doing with it. You can hear what the composer was uh, uh, making. Um, but today's lecture is actually probably going to be a little bit more um, perhaps rambling because there are a bunch of other things to talk about. This one might be a bit more personal. I'll start by just by talking about how I got into it. When I was 15, um, it was 1985, I was living in Walnut Creek, and I already knew that, Walnut, that uh, electronic music was the kind of music I wanted to make. But for the life of me, I could not figure out how, how it constituted live performance. When I listened to records by Kraftwerk, when I listened to records, the records on the radio, they were so clearly not um, acoustic music. They were so clearly edited, so completely constructed, that it was difficult for me to relate to how they were even made. Uh, you had to wonder how musicians performed this together, what the, uh, the aesthetic was. And uh, as a 15-year-old, you also had to wonder how to go, how to, how to network, how to find the concerts. When you went to a concert um, by an act like the Human League, so much of it was pre-recorded that you would be left on the outside of it. You was like, this is, this is not live music. So as a 15-year-old, I was already asking myself questions about what, what live music even really was by that point, when all of the interesting sounds were actually things like DJ scratch mix records, other people manipulating mixing recordings. So anyway, uh, it was around 12.30 at night, and I was just channel surfing uh, the radio, and I came across this spot on the dial. Sometimes when you still had an analog tuner receiver, you could get in two stations at once. You, while you were flipping through the dial, you, the, like, you could just find that magic spot where you could hear like a Christian talk show host like talking over a hip hop track, or uh, you, know, you could hear two things just sort of sitting naturally next to each other. And I got to a point on the dial where clearly there was so much going on that I just hit this magic automatic collage uh, on the radio. Only very quickly, it actually became clear that there were maybe four or five things going on, that records were being physically stopped and started. Um, there was someone clearly very, very 
clumsily and amateurishly playing electric guitar over the top of this record that was being stopped and started. And whenever the record stopped, the guitarist would like pause and stumble for a couple of seconds. And then the record would like turn back on and be played at 45 and the guitarist would play really fast. And then all of a sudden there was a clicking sound and the guitar stopped and I realized that the guitarist had been playing over the phone and they had, the people in the studio had hung up on him. Um, tapes from three or four totally different conversations were being cut in and out uh, with each other and there was a microphone on in the studio so that you could actually sort of hear the hands on the board. You could hear the clicking of the relays and you could hear them actually really smashing the mute button and uh, you could hear them performing the mixing board and the light bulb went off and I went, oh my God, of course live music exists. But live music can be now made out of recordings. You can take finished works by other people and um, you don't have to pretend that you're the audience. You don't have to passively uh, listen to the recording all the way through. You can actually stop and start them, which I don't think I would have been able to put it into words like this at the time when I was 15, but um, it was incredibly satisfying to realize that a recorded piece of music, we often make the mistake of thinking of a recorded piece of music as something that exists as an object, as something that doesn't need people anymore. Um, because the disc or the vinyl or the CD is sitting out there on the shelf, it exists when you're not listening to it. But music is kind of inherently live performance. And when I was listening to all these recordings being collaged and manipulated and put together, it became, the light bulb went off, like every single time you play a recording, it's a live performance. It's a new live piece of music. The music is different, every, even when you play the same piece of music by yourself, sitting in a, a room three different times, you're a different person every single time you listen to it. The performance is the music coming out of the speaker. It's a different piece of music every single time you listen to it in a room with different people. And it's definitely a different piece of music if you, don't know when you're going to stop and start and play it again and cut it in with other things. So I'll play a brief example from, I grabbed a cassette, I taped the rest of that night's episode. It was a program called Over the Edge on KPFA by this group Negative Land. And this is, um, this is what was on the air about 10 minutes after I began recording. Hey, what if they blow us up? What if we all go to Kingdom Come? Come on, I'm saying put a shield up to prevent any uh, nuclear missile coming in from any uh, spot in the world. But Ray. And if both countries, both superpowers, but Ray. put in space a defensive nuclear shield. But Ray, what if they blow us up? What if we all go to Kingdom Come? Come on, uh, all it is is a defensive uh, maneuver and a uh, an idea that would uh, put a shield up. But Ray. Defensive nuclear shield. What if they blow us up? If we can uh, uh, defend ourselves and uh, put in space a defensive nuclear shield through lasers or whatever. What do they blow us up? And if both countries... But Ray, but Ray, what do they blow us up? What if we all go to Kingdom Come? Come on, I'm, I'm talking, I'm saying that if... What if we all go to Kingdom Come? Come on, a nuclear... If we can uh, uh, defend ourselves and... Uh, but Ray. A defensive nuclear shield. But Ray, Ray then that, I think, is the way to go. We've got to get away from this mad doctrine. Uh, that is that uh, we can... Uh, what do they blow us up? I'm, I'm talking serious. I'm not talking in such a ridiculous terms. If we can uh, uh, defend such a ridiculous terms to prevent anything in a nuclear war, while I'm not talking a lot more sense. Uh, nuclear missile coming in, uh, that to me makes a serious spot in the world. I'm talking in such a ridiculous terms. What do they blow us up? What do they blow us up? What do they blow us up? Kingdom come. Come on, I'm saying that if the Soviets... What do they blow us up? They never have. Yeah. What do they blow us up? Whatever. Then that to me makes a lot more sense. But wait. What if we all go to Kingdom Come? Come on, put a shield up to prevent any nuclear war while our people, they are... But Ray... They are hostage. We are naked as jaybirds. What if they blow us up? Then that, I think, is the way to go. We've got to get away from this mad doctrine, which is highly immoral to me. But Ray... Uh, that is that uh, we can... Ray... Uh, deter a nuclear war by keeping each other's populations hostage. There's only one thing. 
the Soviets uh, don't believe that. They never have. That way. And they've been uh, instructing their people how to survive an atomic uh, bomb and a nuclear war, while our people, they are, they are hostage. We are naked as jaybirds. Well... I'm not naked. Well, you are naked. I'm not naked, Ray. And thanks a lot. Well, you are naked, and I'm naked, too. Good night. Thank you very much. So you hear turntables being started and stopped. You hear an oboe basically being played with uh, a nice little DX7 harpsichord sound, sort of like you hear lots of live electronic music instruments mixed with recordings, mixed with additional echo, and more importantly, you hear... A, a, that, that part of the show was clearly not improvised. That was a tape that was created in advance by Don Joyce, a member of Negative Land, um, edited off of tape, tape radio, talk radio, and um, uh, extended out uh, almost seamlessly. The edits are... It's clearly very edited because you don't actually hear someone repeat. If you're some, one of the first things you notice when you work with loops is that it's almost impossible to say something exactly the same way with your throat twice in a row. You can't actually scream exactly the same way. Your larynx actually won't let you shape the sound. People know in general when they're hearing a loop because it's actually incredibly physically difficult to pronounce a loop exactly the same way twice. So we're obviously already in the world of the Uncanny Valley when you're dealing with you know, tapes like that. But the other interesting thing, when you hear a tape that is that highly edited, um, is just how easy it is to edit something and make them say something that they never intended to say. Uh, and that this is clearly what's happening on the news all the time. When you're seeing someone quoted on the news representing themselves, um, it's them, it's their voice. It, in those moments that you're seeing them, you are helplessly exposed to them. They are, they are representing themselves, but the amount of power in the edit, the presentation, the framing, even the six to 120 seconds that they are allowed, that, that is chosen by someone else to represent them, um, it, much more than just them is being represented when their own voice is being used. Uh, the people who edit the news are ridiculously powerful people. So when you actually hear a tape like this that has been profoundly edited, it almost brings to uh, your attention just how easy it is to mislead people. We were told America was sick and tired of the eavesdropping of the jackbooted thugs in the Patriot Act. Big Brother, the Bush administration. He's listening to Grandma and her recipes, right? Checking all the libraries. The Bush administration did nothing to free us from the energy grip of foreign dictators or the lobbying efforts of big businesses. Through Dick Cheney's so-called emergency laws, the fascist state's grip started to tighten. But that is not what America said it wanted. So we did the quintessentially American thing. We voted the other way. We said, enough. Now on with the other guy. We're going to go to the other guy and put him in power. And now that that's happened, people are realizing, wait a minute, grass isn't any greener on the other side. In fact, it's exact same color. Americans on both sides now are saying, hang on, I have haven't I seen this movie before? Enough! So now, now here we sit. We have the tea parties. We have the 912 project. Today, have you seen TV? The G20 riots, they're all on TV. People throwing stuff through glass windows. It all proves that no matter what side of the aisle, the radicals with an agenda on the streets, or the mom or the dad who's a plumber, going to the streets for the tea parties. People once again are feeling oppressed by an out of control state. We watch day after day as the problems that can and should be solved locally instead seem to be made worse with thousand page bills and trillions of dollars spent. Public private partnerships are created or now new global treaties. So now the world has a different fear. Now, we're afraid of the government growing larger. 
We're now afraid of the exact same things that I was called crazy for, for even just suggesting two years ago. Things like, oh, they're going to nationalize our banks. They're going to put the government in charge of pi private payrolls. They're going to move to nationalize our auto industry. And here's the one key word, using the word crisis to obtain the unprecedented power needed to make it all happen. Um, there are many examples of just how far Fox was willing to go. But at the time, in 2009, watching Fox News, like a thunderclap, it hit me that these guys were culture jamming, that these guys basically had learned their lessons from the same uh, the same artists that I had grown up listening to. Here's a screenshot. To the left is the actual photograph, and the right is what they broadcast on the air. There's another one. These were two journalists that had just published facts that, like, you know, Fox News wanted to take on, and so they needed to be represented live on the air, and that's, that's how they did it. Um, there are... Uh, yeah, there could eventually be, oh, here's another one. This is the one that I just found this morning that is, uh, here's a nice graph. Here's a really nice graph that they put up. <laughs> Facts. Facts. But uh, the ultimate final turbocharged version of this lecture, all of the rules of engineering that I learned from those Douglas Kahn and those Irv Teibel and those negative land cutups of how to seamlessly edit so that you actually, basically, you know, the edits are not what you notice. Um, Fox News employed some of the most brilliant editing, some of the most incredible video editors I had ever seen. There are dozens of tricks you can use. Uh, in the 2000s, the general shorthand uh, editing signal that you've clipped someone, if you have a talking head on the screen and they're talking and you want to clip out like maybe a sentence or two, the edit is hidden with a white flash. But the white flash is more than just like a white flash that sort of, uh, if you do a direct cut on someone who's talking, of course, and you cut out a sentence, their head will have glitched to a new position and it will look weird. So the white flash is a way of sort of softening the edit. But the white flash is also, in many ways, a signal of good faith that an edit has happened. When you're watching someone speaking and you see that white flash, you know that something has been removed and that you are dealing with a construction. Well, Fox News doesn't always show you those white edits. In fact, there's almost a two-for-one uh, gotcha where they will cut away from the person who's speaking while the edit happens and they'll cut to a reaction shot in the audience of someone looking skeptically at President Obama and they'll, you know, like one of their favorite things to do was to cut to the audience and show a black teenager looking at him as if he was, as if they were incredibly bored. And that's when the edit happens and then they cut back to uh, the president and um, these are total deceptions. There was a website called Media Matters that would go in step at a time and like basically lay out all of the, uh, the changes or you know, um, show a Hannity report in which Obama was literally, would be quoting a Republican senator saying a completely crazy thing that they were going to do and Hannity would pull that quote and present it as if it was something that Obama pr planned to do himself. Like just outright total editing deceptions coming with you at a blurring speed that you couldn't even uh, keep up with. So 2009, that's when I began realizing that culture jamming, this sort of praxis, this sort of philosophy that I had grown up with almost idealistically thinking was inherently kind of a progressive thing. It was very clear where the power was. But of course, once Obama was elected, people Perhaps culture jamming is something that still at its root feels like you're punching up, feels like a method of taking on power, but the power had shifted just enough that the people who were doing the punching up were no longer even remotely really um, affiliated with the left. And it's gotten worse from there. James O'Keefe is a prankster who, um, one of his first 
real pranks was taking on ACORN, which was a community housing project, or like vote enrollment community housing project. And um, oh, it's too much to sum up now, but his, the most striking thing about his constructions is how badly he hides his edits, how absolutely constructed and false his collage work is, and yet simply by presenting it, you don't even need to make a convincing media remix anymore in order to have people buy it. The, uh, the narratives that are at work are so strong and the, uh, the country is so divided that um, even the most simplistic remixes are enough to send people down the, uh, the wrong hole. So I'll play this really fast. This is another clip. Um, well, in the weeks after Charlottesville, I watched a lot of the footage of uh, uh, the Charlottesville protests as they went down. And simply clicking on these things fills up your YouTube responses with um, other related material. And I actually kind of noticed this in 2016. Over the course of the election, pro-Trump and absolutely anti-Hillary propaganda vastly outweighed all other content in my recommendations. Uh, there's an interesting experiment you can try. Type in one crazy Trump video or conspiracy theory content and then just basically look at the next six things that YouTube recommends and then hit up next five times in a row without even watching it. And then take a look at where you are there with your right hand column recommendations. You will be surrounded. And even though you'll be surrounded by people that you know are crazy people, the fact that you're surrounded by them actually drastically affected the tone and the seeming reality of the election. Uh, CNN has their own news formats, their talking heads. You know, no one really enjoys watching the conventions of general cable TV news. It's kind of repulsive. So actually watching someone screaming at the top of their heads about how Charlottesville was absolutely a false flag media construction setup um, almost seems more refreshing, like you're more in touch with reality than actually watching five minutes of CNN. But let's watch this really fast. The six buses lined up, someone that lives in Charlottesville, that the six buses were lined up and people were getting off the bus with KKK shirts on and, and BLM shirts. At this. I'm like, what? Now, same that, while same that may bus. not sound credible, while it may not sound credible to a lot of people, to us who don't trust the news media, and that could be very credible. Edit. Okay, so that was a moment from our latest Trump voter panel, and what they were saying there is that they believe that many of the protesters in Charlottesville were paid actors bust in to cause trouble. I asked them to show me the evidence, so after our taping, they sent us this video that they saw on YouTube. This was all set up. You understand? The whole thing. First of all, you're not gonna have on a KKK t-shirt and you're not gonna have on a Black Lives Matter t-shirt getting off the same brand of buses parked back to back. We talking about bumper to bumper, not the same area, bumper to bumper. I'm glad that the woman who told me this is okay because she was in that alley. It was not on the street where those people got hit. In other words, their source of this theory is some guy in a car whose friend told him she saw buses in an alley arriving. That video that I just showed you has been viewed more than 840,000 times. Three million times. He, that guy there, also linked to an ad from a PR company looking apparently for actors to appear at celebrity events and yes, rallies and protests in Charlotte, North Carolina, not Charlottesville, Virginia. Still, that's interesting. So we chased that thread, as reporters do, and we found out that the owner of that PR company says he had nothing to do with Charlottesville. Our reporters on the ground in Charlottesville saw nothing of any buses or what that guy in his car describes. The organizers of the rally say they did not hire any actors, and PolitiFact looked into this and rated this entire conspiracy theory as false. Well, thanks, CNN. Uh... 
it's all ridiculous except I've spent enough time watching all of the other if you go into the wormhole you will find people taking the uploads uh, that were made on the mall in Charlottesville in the 30 minutes before the actual car crash that took the life of Heather Heyer and spending two to three hours analyzing and, di and dissecting um, all available video footage as if it were the Zapruder film uh, detailing the assassination of Kennedy. They are basically going, see that guy right there? See that? See how his arm is sticking out a little bit? Like that's actually, that's, that's not, an arm can't actually do, like the arm isn't in that position. And then how is he also in this part of the mall 30 seconds later? He, he, he must have had to run. He totally ran. And here, clearly, they photoshopped out the cables. And this car that's idling right there, that's like gone 30 seconds later, like, why was that car idling there? Um, not only is this media far more interesting and more credible and more entertaining to watch than this two-minute CNN footage that I've just uh, shown you, and I... Um, I've often these people who start, I'm already slightly through the wormhole, but I'm through the wormhole just enough that I understand why this CNN disavowal, how this uh, attempt to debunk the Charlottesville conspiracy and get to the heart of, um, I understand why CNN's attempt to debunk this hoax, this, or not hoax, but this red herring is almost proof that it really happened. <laughs> uh, the point is that someone, and when you watch the original clip of that guy in a car, basically, and his story is simply that he's a Charlottesville resident who lived several blocks from uh, Emancipation Park that had been taken over by neo-Nazis, and he's struggling to find an explanation for how in the world this could have happened to his hometown. And he's a credible person. I don't think he's hoaxing myself. I think he is struggling to find a narrative, an explanation for what happened in Charlottesville that is more reasonable than 400 neo-Nazis materializing out of nowhere self-confidently enough to actually protest in public and then thousands of people showing up to take them out and someone dying. Um, I think he is struggling to find a reason and this reason of false flags, of government intervention, of uh, CIA, of COINTELPRO, all of these narratives that have been baking in the underbelly of uh, American consciousness for the last 40 years, more and more of which we find is actually true all the, all the time, these narratives actually provide more of a framework. And all you need to do is post to YouTube and, well, you will have a competing version of reality. I'll play one other picture. This is uh, an almost hilariously more meaningless subject matter to, uh, to compare and contrast, but just to show you what we're sort of up against. Oh gosh, where is it? Oh, drat. It's not, uh, perhaps it's on the key drive, but the key drive is not in my pocket. The point is, there were people in 2016 who were culture jamming and posting vile stuff about Hillary Clinton with the express intent of exposing their media hoax later and uh, thereby revealing to the public that you can't trust the media. Uh, things were getting crazy enough in 2016 that some people basically in almost exactly the same way with the same intent of the original Helter Stupid project were trying to get everybody to sign on and believe in a certain totally fictitious myth about Hillary Clinton in the hopes that when then exposing it, everyone would wake up and start stop believing the majority of the rest of the stuff. But what we find in the modern media ecology in that 2016 is that even if you have the express intent of perpetrating a hoax with the hopes of later revealing it and thereby illustrating the way that the current Twitter, YouTube, mass media, conglomeration, media ecology works, no one pays attention. Only the lie gets propagated and the reveal, the retraction, gets no retweets. 
the picture that I was going to show you was a picture of uh, Taylor Swift coming to the defense of a young internet celebrity, Logan Paul, who had been disgraced. And it was a picture of Twitter of uh, Taylor Swift saying, hey, this guy's OK. We should listen to his opinions and a link to a CNN article. And that was a Twitter post that had gotten retweeted 20,000 times, even though it was a dead link. It did not link to a CNN article. It linked to nothing. The two pictures were utterly constructed. And there were many, many comments. So this utter fabrication to a dead link of a CNN article that did not even exist from a person who had 20 followers got 20,000 propagations and showed up on everybody's timelines. Uh, you don't have to care about Logan Paul and Twitter's Taylor Swift yourself to realize that many of the stories and the narratives that basically now show up in our feeds that we are consciously tuning out that we think don't matter to us, the ease of injecting noise in the way that Negative Land did in the 80s by writing a press release that then had to, over the course of months, get picked up and injected by careless, non-fact-checking editors, we all have that access now. And Marshall McLuhan was right. The television screen is our nervous system. We don't quite, so much of what we take in day by day for our facts is visually gleaned from our feeds. And um, there's no vetting. There's no vetting at all. It's completely out of control. So if there's a difference between the 80s version of culture jamming where there seemed to be an inherent intellectual responsibility to follow through and then illustrate to everybody, if the point of hoaxing is to show people to be more careful, then those artists have lost that control to follow their projects through to the final step. Um, and what we find with a lot of the current uh, generation of culture jammers that are trying to take down power to inject chaos to introduce uncertainty is that the introduction of uncertainty is in fact the end game. Like they are not trying to, the point of the hoax project is not to have everyone be more conscious of just how irresponsible the media is. The point is to simply laugh at the people who are stupid enough to believe in the things that are presented. The point is total chaos, total disruption, and the lack of any uh, faith in what any of us have the ability to even learn. Uh, I've been talking with friends of mine who have been teaching media studies classes for the last 30 years, and it's been pretty clear that media classes as of 2006, 2010, and the advice that they give students is really hopelessly out of date. For years, what they've been telling people is do your own research. Go to libraries. Go, uh, don't just take a headline. Resist the urge to basically trust the headline or even see a headline out of the corner of your eye on a newspaper and take that for the narrative and like, you know, keep yourself informed that way. If there's something that you really care about, go to a library and find two or three actual vetted sources, look them up, do your own research. So media studies professors have been going to rooms of high school students and college students for decades now, basically. And the, the main thing that is the main take home from all those lectures is do your own research. And that's exactly what people have been doing for the last 10 years, only they've been doing their research with Google. And I've done this myself, and it feels far more interactive and intellectually satisfying. Like, if something's interesting, I do go to Google. But uh, it's pretty clear that over the last 10 years, search engine optimization has been gamed so that if you are using Google to find your own research, up until 2016, between the years of 2013 and 2016, anyone Googling the name Martin Luther King Jr. would encounter within the top 10 hits uh, alternate biographies con constructed by alt-right sites such as Stormfront and neo-Nazi organizations telling you the real truth of Dr. Martin Luther King's legacy. These would be in the top 10 hits. So someone who was a little confused in doing their own research about Martin Luther King Jr. went down a wormhole. When we interviewed, when people interviewed Dylan Roof, the person who did the, uh, the church shooting, who walked in, who was convinced that uh, 
the white race is in physical danger. He described how he came to those beliefs, and it was through doing his own research on Google. And um, the Stormfront people are culture jammers. I just have to realize in my teenage idealism at the time, realizing that what seemed like an inherently progressive praxis can be gamed by anyone. So at this point, almost the only thing that I can hope for is um, that we update our media studies prog uh, courses. And uh, media literacy is, of course, more important than ever. But the game is over. Um, media art that basically lifts the curtain and shows you how easy to edit is really only the first step at this point. Uh, there's a bunch of other stuff I could play, but I don't, um, I'd almost rather start the question and answer period now. This is where the lecture reveals itself as completely in progress. Um, I could play more music that I like, but uh, if anyone has any questions, I guess it is 127. We can totally call it. <laughs> Hi. I, I, um, up here. Yeah. I wonder if you would mind on your browser opening up the San Francisco Chronicle. Oh, misspelled. I just, and then scroll down a little bit on the right hand side. Oh, yeah. So I just thought it was very apropos oh, for yeah, today's yeah. lecture. Oh, no, yeah, no. I almost tried to find some of these things. Um, well, uh, yes. The built in features in um, a year ago, Premiere introduced a new video editing effect. Earlier, I was talking about the uh, white flash that would happen that would mask edits on a talking head. Two years ago, they introduced a new algorithm that lets you morph between the shots. So you no longer actually have to have the white flash. You can cut out an entire sentence of a talking head, and Premiere's algorithms will blur and shape the head so that the head will naturally seem to move into the new position within the half second over uh, the, the split second before and after the splice. So the splice is now totally invisible. And they demonstrated it by showing clips of people editing out somebody saying the word not. So that someone's denial instantly became the opposite of a denial, where people seemed, it was the exact analog of the Irv Teibel Nixon tape, where somebody suddenly seemed to be confessing to something that they were denying. Um, these are presets in software now, increasingly. Like they are, they're creative tools, but they're not being advertised, and they're being advertised to creative professionals, but, um, well, we've seen what Fox News has been doing with them for the last 10 years. And these things are definitely about to start showing up in your feed. We've been talking about the end of photography as evidence of anything for 30 years now, but I'm not sure we are quite yet prepared for the end of video as evidence of anything. Um, mm. Yeah, yeah, watch all of this. And uh, I'm sure a lot of you use this software, use Final Cut Pro, use Premiere. Uh, all of these creative tools, well, actually, I'll, I'll find, hang on. That uses audio only and does. Like all dads, I worry about my girl's safety all the time, especially when we see preventable violence in places our sons and daughters go every day. To demonstrate the power of the method, we apply the same input speech mapped to four different target videos. Note that all four are synthetic and have different lighting conditions. The auto industry, to help families refinance their homes, to invest in things like high-tech manufacturing, clean energy, and the infrastructure that creates good new jobs. Not to mention the job training that helps folks earn new skills to fill those jobs. The results are clear. America's businesses have created 14.5 million new jobs over 75 straight months. It doesn't look like, it doesn't look right. It doesn't look right yet. 
right now it looks good enough so that if something like this shows up in your feed and you're scrolling by it really fast and you look at it for five minutes, or if you're watching Hannity and one of those is on a subset inset screen in the background for three seconds and Obama says something terrible or anyone says something terrible, you'll be like, I can't believe he said that. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't have any kind of, uh, I, you know, this is just good to know, isn't it? Yes. Go ahead, screen. <laughs> okay. um, I was wondering um, if you've heard of Angela Nagel's book, Kill All Norms. Kill All Norms, yes. Um, and I was kind of thinking of that, and I was thinking of trolling. And um, a lot of the things you said, like, and in the end, I'm not sure if you meant that, but you said a lot of it was the point was to laugh at the people and how stupid they are to believe this or to be somehow, like, engaged by this, to take it seriously, to be triggered, whatever. Um, I was just wondering, what is the difference between the between what Negative Land was doing, art, or and trolling? Well, this has been the total existential crisis of faith that I've been having over the last five years. What is the difference between negative land and Kekistan? Like the entire, the entire art of trolling for the sake of trolling. And um, well, culture jamming does seem to have an element of punching up, punching up, taking on power. It's just that currently there are schisms over, uh, disagreements over what power you're punching up to, you know. What's really amazing, we have some pieces on the next Negative Land record where we cut in media broadcasts from the Black Panthers and the Weathermen from the 70s with the Unabomber Manifesto from the 90s with um, armed militias in the Midwest or uh, in the South, basically, all basically promising to take down the government. And all of these radically different political ideologies track onto each other. There is more in common than you could possibly imagine. You, you're, you, you get dizzy, basically, seeing all the things in common. Uh, under the hood, of course, there are radically different ideals of what society should be. And the left basically, oh, hard to summarize, but like, you know, the idea that maybe diversity is good and that we need to work towards empathy and inclusion. And uh, the disturbing thing about the trolls that are basically arguing for the right to free speech, the right to freedom, um, they're not all necessarily Nazis, but the overall leaning of Kekistan does sort of seem to eventually lead towards a weird kind of nationalism or a weird kind of exclusion or a hoped for a return to definitions that will make things more structured. When you listen to, I'm not saying that all trolls are Richard Spencer and longing for the white ethno state, but um, when you hang out at those free speech rallies, you will eventually start hanging out with people who do believe that. And the fear is that the current tools of culture jamming and trolling are uh, putting you in the company of people that will expose you to a little bit too much of that kind of ideology. And that's I'm already disoriented enough seeing the most col effective culture jamming of the last 10 years being deployed by, by Milo and by, by people on the alt-right. Like, I, I can't imagine, this was idealistic of me when I was a teenager. I thought this was inherently, I, th I thought culture jamming was almost inherently a leftist praxis. <laughs> it's not, it's really not. So um, what's the difference? The crazy thing about Kill All Normies and Kekistan assailing conformity and normies is just how reminiscent this is of the language of the Church of the Subgenius in the 80s and how they took on normals, but they were decrying Christian fundamentalism. Um, there are very different things under the hood. That's, I guess, what I'm, what I'm hoping. <laughs> But the last thing I'll say is that you will often run into people online these days who will, when the conversation gets a little bit polarized, will respond by posting a swastika, and then they'll say, I don't believe this. I'm posting the swastika simply to trigger you, to show you how easily manipulable you are. This swastika does not represent my belief, 
this represents how small headed and how how small your thinking is. Um, but one of the main characters in that book, Kill All Normies, Weave, the guy who actually had a swastika tattooed on his chest to trigger people. Uh, when you're dealing with those people who are artists at trolling, who are trying to like provoke you, um, they start off by posting swastikas, not out of belief, but you know, within five years they are working the IT at the Daily Stormer or whatever. Like those people who like tattoo swastikas usually kind of end up being actual neo Nazis. So it's it's hopefully ultimately less confusing than uh, than you'd fear. <laughs> Any other questions? So I want to ask you about the idea of detritus uh, in the. Um, so have you ever read Robert Anton Wilson's uh, Illuminatus trilogy? Yes. And, uh, oh, God, what is, uh, what is the name of his? Yes, yes, I have. Go ahead. Ask well, the question. You know, it's the idea is that, like, it's all these archetypes of culture, all these heroes, all these yes. anti-heroes. Cosmic and, trigger. That's yeah, cosmic trigger, right. Yes. And they're all kind of slammed together and smeared around, and what they do and what they how they interact kind of, it's almost like as you read it, you're watching the archetypes in your brain kind of rewire. Yes. And no, his, uh, his main quote is, the intelligence is the ability to hold two completely diametrically opposed ideas in your head as true without going insane. Totally. That's, that's good advice. So it's, uh, what's interesting about that is that it then becomes just, uh, just a kind of a flattening, a smearing of symbols. Uh, and so, which, which sounds to me like uh, it, it's, the, the symbols become somewhat Meaningless, uh, and then become maybe the, the falling down of the of the the detritus of society's ideas. So, what my question was is, uh, after the detritus, if it's in that model, if this, if you agree with this, if that is being detritus, um, what if, if the detritus is by function the kind of what becomes the fertilizer for then the next growth after that? What would be? Do you have any ideas of what you've been thinking about? Would be the next growth of society after such a decomposition? Hmm. That is a likably abstract question. Um, well, the signifiers do mean something. They do point back to something real. And I think we've reached a point of living inside the simulacra for such a long time where uh, the door to the outside of the museum really does seem to be closing, closing recently. Like we are depending on the representations far too much and not spending enough time around real animals or even around real people. We're, we're dealing with the horrific representations of them. So the detritus, the remix culture, uh, it's beautiful. I love swimming in these references. There's uh, my favorite Herman Hesse book is The Glass Bead Game, in which culture has evolved to a point where the sheer evolved uh, state of aesthetic play is taking previous artifacts of humanity and finding new connections between them, like building, you win the glass bead game, a satisfying glass bead game, by finding connections among previous human achievements and showing the one universal truth underlying all of it. Um, and um, in Herman Hesse's book, that, that society is clearly on the verge of collapse. So um, I, I spend less time sampling now and more times just list, like going on hikes and listening to birds and listening to recordings of whales. I wonder if the, um, the mistake of appropriation and remix culture and culture jamming was moving more and more toward the reuse of dominant imagery and sound as opposed to creating new alternative imagery and sound. So that the, the, in modernism, the idea was to create things that were never seen before and the idea of originality and so on. Um, and, and that produced, you know, for an extraordinary new kind of visual and sonic vocabulary, and its exhaustion move and 
the rise of media culture and so on sort of um, move people toward the dominant. And maybe now we have to rethink that whole question of what it means to you know, appropriate both politically and aesthetically. And, and perhaps that's maybe a more optimistic um, way to begin to think about what creative art making might be in hmm. this moment. Well, there's more culture and more data than ever before. And I can't even imagine, in the 80s, I felt like I was always playing catch up because there was so much musical history that I want, and I wanted to know all of it. Like I, I uh, uh, there wasn't any music that I actually didn't want to like. I wanted to like all of it. Like I kind of wanted to find what was good in all of it and find the commonality. And uh, sampling art sort of helps you do that while saving time. Like I, not only is it sort of, um, I, I love global remix culture, like the emotional move, it's emotionally moving when you hear two or three people that were never in the same room with each other that like were not even alive at the same points in human history and they all sort of seem to be singing in tune. Like those pieces that posit McLuhan's global village like and you know show you more culture at once it's beautiful, it's reassuring, and like some of these uh, pieces of music actually do. When you hear two different cultures singing in tune, in the back of your head, like it sort of provides a model. It's like, oh, maybe we, I, maybe we can all get along. Maybe there is a continuum. So I, I'm not writing off remix culture. It's, um, um, and maybe instead of phrasing the modernist impulse towards originality as like you know something that we need to get back to, we just need to get back to actually being in the same room with each other more often, and actually not recognizing the media representations of each other's thoughts and languages in Facebook po uh, posts or Twitter posts, but actually just spending more time at. Uh, community political conversations or co-ops or uh, you know discussing the best thing about Occupy Wall Street and going to Zuccotti Park was the density of the conversation happening everywhere you walked like you would walk around and um, instead of getting offended by one comment or one conversation that struck you as wrong you'd engage them in conversation and like you know the conversation would go six prong really quickly um, and we don't need to wait for another Occupy Wall Street to be having those conversations, but uh, it's more likely original art will come out of more time spent in group conversation with each other rather than on online forums, because at this point we can't even trust the faces we're seeing. Something like that. Other questions? Well, thank you. This was really wonderful and provoking. And, um, We will see you next week when Lynn Hirschman will, I'm sure, add another layer.